cover a wide range of interdisciplinary uh, research topics. Today, we have among us one such academician who has extensively worked across many interdisciplinary research topics. I welcome Dr. Shayan Day. Dr. Day is currently working as a postdoctoral fellow at WIT Center of Diversity Studies, University of Witwatersrand, Zoansburg. He is also a faculty fellow in the Harriet Tubman Institute at York University, Canada. His recent publications include Myths, Histories, Decolonial Intervention, published by Rutledge in 2022. In 2022, Rutledge also published his monograph, Green Academia. His areas of research interests are post-colonial studies, decolonial studies, critical race studies, food humanities, and etc. He can also be reached through his website, www.scienday.com. We welcome you, sir. We look forward to the extremely fascinating research topic that is of today's lecture. Before we begin, I would also like to request Professor Debashri Prashad Nath, Head, Department of Cultural Studies at Tejpur University, to say a few words on this occasion. Sir, please. Thank you, Bursha. And uh, thank you, Dr. Day. We are all here to listen to your talk today. So we'll be quickly moving on to that. But thank you so much for accepting this offer uh, that was made by our young scholars. And thank you. Thank you so much. And let's keep this association going in times to come. And we will be in touch, surely. But uh, I mean, apart from your very interesting talk, I mean, what you know uh, is going to be very interesting, as we can all see, we are uh, all, you know, I'm seriously, seriously thankful to you for having accepted this offer. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh Thank you so much, Barsha, and thank you so much, Dr. Nath, uh, for, for your kind words, for the warm introduction and the invitation. And uh, I, at the personal level, I feel honestly very privileged and happy to be a part of this space and getting a scope to share a certain perspectives of my research that I'm currently engaging with as a part of my postdoctoral project. So uh, what I'm going to do in the course of next uh, 30 to 35 minutes is uh, I'm going to engage and share with the different aspects of what do I mean by uh, Afro-Indian Creole musical practices in Gujarat and um, how the musical practices of a certain community who are popularly known as the Siddhis uh actually widely speaks not only to their african or to be very specific um eastern african and northeastern african ancestral traditions on the one side but also it very much speaks to the local uh musical cultures of gujarat as well uh to be very specific the indian sufi cultures of gujarat that is widely practiced uh, by the Muslim community there and also by other communities uh, there. Now, uh, to begin with a very basic perspective is uh, who are the Siddhis? Uh, probably uh, there would be a few or maybe many in this audience who might be familiar with the Siddhi community in Gujarat, but I'm also sure there would be many who are not very familiar. So for all of us, uh, let's have a brief introduction. Now, uh, Siddhis, they're also known as Hapshis. Uh, the other name is Hapshis, but widely we'll find they're known as Siddhis. Uh, they centrally arrived in India in 13th century during the Islamic invasion, during 12th and 13th century that took place through Gujarat. They came to India um, from different parts of Eastern and Northeastern Africa, like Ethiopia, if you look at Zanzibar, if you look at Sudan, uh, if you look at the Nubian Valley that sort of covers Egypt and Sudan together, uh, then if you look at Kenya, if you look at Tanzania, they mainly arrived from those places and through parts of Central Asia. And uh, they were brought to Gujarat uh, 
mostly as slaves and uh, palace keepers as palace guards and slaves. Uh, but there were also people who later on uh, got promoted as army men, as army keepers, as, uh, you know, uh, keepers or as treasurers in the palace of the kings there in Gujarat. And uh, then as chiefs of armies, uh, as architects, as musicians and in different other professional spaces. That was the that is one aspect of the arrival of the Siddhis in India. The other route that we can trace with respect to the arrival of the Siddhis in India from Africa is at the time of the arrival of the Portuguese colonizers. Now, if you remember, the Portuguese colonizers entered India from the southern parts. Now, if we just quickly sketch the map of India, just the outline of the Indian map, we would see that the southern part of India, specifically Kerala, is directly placed to the southern part of South Africa. If you look, if you see the Cape Town and Kerala, you see they face each other like this. So what happened is when the Portuguese came from uh, around the Cape of Good Hope, they took a turn from the Cape of Good Hope and then they gradually steered towards India, towards Kerala. Uh, at that time, they also brought a lot of uh, several African slaves from the southern parts of Africa. And these African slaves, mostly today, the Siddhi community that we find in places like Maharashtra, in places like Karnataka, a few in Goa and Kerala, they mostly trace their origin from southern parts of Africa, a few from South Africa, from Zimbabwe and other parts of South Africa or southern Africa. So widely what we see, the Siddhis who are who mostly exist in southern parts of India and also in Telangana as well. I forgot to mention that they they mostly trace their ancestry from southern parts of Africa and the Siddhis who exist in Gujarat and also towards Pakistan as well. There are a massive Siddhi community which exists in Pakistan as well, that especially in that location that shares its borders with Gujarat. They mostly trace their ancestry from the eastern and northeastern parts of Africa. Now, today, obviously, in my talk, I'm going to specifically focus on the Siddhi community of Gujarat and uh, with respect to one of their specific uh, musical practice, which is basically re referred to as Zikr practice. Now, uh, what is basically Zikr? What happens at the time of Zikr? Now, during the time of Zikr, what happens is uh, the Siddhi community in different parts of Gujarat. If you go to a place like Bhavnagar, Jamnagar, Ahmedabad, and if you go towards Daman and Diu and towards the National Park region as well, you will see in these places that Siddhi community exists in large numbers. And usually at the time of uh, different like celebrating uh, the birthday of their Sufi saints, uh, the celebrating the or sort of mourning the death anniversary of the Sufi saints, they basically perform zikrs. Now, zikrs are a type of song where uh, which is which has a lot of similarities with Kavalis. In what happens in Kavalis, there is a lead singer and then there are other singers in Kavali they sing will sing a line and the other singers will repeat that so when you listen to the zikas obviously after some time i request barsha to play a documentary uh, where you will find it in a more clear way where they will sing a line and the other singers would repeat that so you will see the siddhi have a, a similarity with the way of kavali singing which is a very integral part of sufi culture as well now, another aspect of the Sufi culture I would like to point out, then I will move to how it also speaks to the African cultural traditions as well, is uh, a lot of these spiritual Sufi songs, I'm not talking of general Sufi songs, a lot of these spiritual Sufi songs starts with blowing the conch shell, we say the shank. So blowing the conch shell, which is also a very integral part of the zikr singing of the Siddhis as well. So they will start with, first they will create a fire, then they will blow the, uh, you know, the conch shell, the shank, and then they will gradually start the process of singing, the zikrs. Now, now this is some similarities that we pointed out with respect to the local Gujarati Sufi singing traditions that the cities have adopted. Now, the other side, let's look at the other side. What are those ancestral cultural traditions that gets reflected through the zikr singing of the Sufis? Now, one thing you will see 
if uh, if you are working specifically on zikr singing culture in sudan uh, there is a culture of performing dhikr it's called d h i k r if you write in english zikr is z i k r in sudan it's called dhikr now uh, dhikr singing the way dhikrs are sang and they also or sing dhikrs at the time of celebrating the birth or the death anniversaries of their respective sufi saints in sudan as well you know the dhikr singing is sung in a similar way number 1 number 2 uh, you know sort of relationality that you see with ancestral uh, like african ancestral traditions is the sort of musical instruments that they use for the sake of performing for instance uh some of the common musical instruments that you see while uh, that are used for performing zikrs is one is musindo now musindo is an traditional eastern african musical instrument which is widely played in sudan and uh, ethiopia and kenya and other parts of eastern africa it looks like a hand drum it looks almost like a mridangam the indian mridangam and it's placed played on the both sides it's a it's a hand percussion instrument the other instrument that you see is mugarman Now, what is Mugarman? Mugarman is a one-sided drum, which is a massive drum. It's a one-sided drum, and you play just on the one side. And that Mugarman is again is a part of the Eastern African musical culture. Another interesting musical instrument, which is very integral, inti- uh, integral to the uh, you know uh, the Siddhi community or the Zikr singing, is referred to as Kanga Misri. Now, what is kanga misri? Kanga misri is a sort of musical instrument which is sound almost like jingle. You know, we play jingles with the both hands. Now, it is a funnel-shaped instrument which has stones in it. It is said that they have hundred eight stones inside. The stones are collected from the ocean, and then they shake with one hand or both hands, and they play while the zikr is sung. So, you know, these are some of the African ancestral musical perspectives or cultures that they have inherited. from their eastern african ancestors now another aspect that i would like to share about uh, the zikr singing of the siddhis and then i will request barsha to start playing the documentary and then i'll stop in the middle of the documentary and try to explain them is uh, the spiritual leaders that the siddhis worship now the siddhis worship mainly they worship if you uh, the siddhis of gujarat specifically uh because the cities of gujarat uh, of gujarat are mostly muslims but if you look at the cities in karnataka the cities in hyderabad are also again muslims but the cities in karnataka they are christian cities there are hindu cities so they have diverse religious affiliations as well so the since the cities of gujarat are muslim so they have these islamic sufi islamic traditional practices within them um now there is a according to the siddhi folklore obviously they are not aware of the date but uh, the story goes like this that uh, when the siddhis arrived in india obviously uh, you know they felt very uprooted and they felt totally uh, you know disconnected from their cultural roots from their social roots and from their emotional roots so they in order to find a space of existence in order to find a space of connectivity they were looking for some sort of spiritual affiliations in gujarat and then they also underwent a lot of forced conversions they were forcefully converted and obviously they were not aware uh, you know to which sort of spiritual affiliation they should uh, you know sort of connect themselves so during that time you know uh, baba gore and my misra the two widely regarded spiritual leaders of the siddhis baba gore my misra along with their uh, five other siblings uh, they have baba habas baba nabi and there are other siblings as well they arrived to the coast of kuda in gujarat kuda is very near to the place of bhavnagar okay now they arrived in the place of kuda in gujarat now what happened when they arrived there they were obviously they arrived on small boats across africa the nubian uh, the nubian valley then they cross central asia then they cross the indian ocean and they all came to gujarat so they were very tired so they thought that they are going to rest for the rest of the night uh, around the beach and then the next morning they will walk into the cities and and explore what is there and what is not there 
Now what happened and why I'm telling this story is how the Siddhi, the spiritual practices of the Siddhi community are also so trans-religious in nature because it speaks a lot to Hindu religious practices as well. Not only to Sufi practice, not only to ancestral African practice, but Hindu practices as well. We will be able to make out from this particular folklore. So now what happened? My Misra was very tired. She was resting in her camp when the rest of the brothers, you know, they went to take a walk around the sea beach. Now, as they were taking a walk around the sea beach, what happened? There was another spiritual deity that was already existent around the sea beach. And that spiritual deity was is popularly known as Makhan Devi. Now, Makhan Devi was existing there. So what happened? Makhan Devi kidnapped one of the brothers and kept him with her. Now, rest of the brothers started requesting her that, please, uh, you know, leave our brother. Uh, we want to go back to our sister. We are very tired. We are foreigners here. We have come for the first time. But Makhan Devi was adamant. Makhan Devi has, was always very childish in nature. Makhan Devi said, you see, I am very alone here. And uh, I feel I have no playmate. I want to play with somebody. So I'm going to keep your brother as a captive and as my playmate. The other brothers kept on requesting, but no, nothing happened. So the brothers returned and then complained to my Misra that you see uh, one of her, of, of her brothers have been kept by Makhan Devi and she's not listening to us. So then my Misra goes to Makhan Devi with the same request, but she is adamant. Then my Misra comes up with an alternate plan. So let me propose you an alternate plan. I promise you that if you leave my brother and let them go, I will give you company forever. And we will interact together, we will play together, and then we will bless people of this land together and forever. Since then, what happened? Makhan Devi's temple and my Misra's Darga at the coast of Kuda are face to face. And since then, what happens if people, whether Muslims, Hindus, or from any other religious group, if they go to worship Makhan Devi, they will obviously worship my Mishra and vice versa. This is the basic rule. Even at the time of Zikr, they will offer food to Makhan Devi. At the same time, they will also offer food to my Mishra as well, simultaneously. And another interesting aspect is, if we go to anywhere in Gujarat where there are Siddhi communities, my Mishra's shrine, or they also refer to a local language as a chilla, are always located near the seaside. Obviously, Baba Gore Shrine, Baba Habash's Shrine, and other siblings' shrine are also located, but not just at the coastline. They are a bit in the interiors of the city. But if you look at my Mishra Shrine, they're always located at the seaside. So I wanted to share this particular story as well, because this actually shows why I have titled my talk or represent the spiritual practice as creolization. Because it is not just about one cultural perspective. So many cultural perspectives from Africa, from India, so many religious perspectives, Hinduism, Islam, Sufism, they're all integrating with each other and interplaying with each other. Now, I will request Borsha to further understand uh, my arguments in a further contextual way. I will request Borsha to just play the documentary and we can stop in the middle for further explanation. Yes, sir. I'll just uh, share the screen. Sure. Is it visible, sir? Uh, it is coming. Yes, now it is visible.
Yes, thank you so much uh, for for pausing here. So what I would like to share here is, uh, you know, if you see at the introduction, I shared that there are basically widely two types of dhamals. One is bataki dhamal, one is the dancing one. So here what we see is the dance version of the dhamal. Now what is dhamal? Dhamal is actually, now what are, now let's also try to understand the bit of the difference between zikr and dhamals. Zikrs are particularly referred to these songs that they are singing. This particular song that they are singing is referred to as a zikr song. This is a characteristic feature of a zikr song. Now, dhamals, what happened? This whole performance, when they are sitting and singing and playing musical instruments, this whole performance is referred to as dhamals. It can be both in the sitting version as well as in the dancing version as well. Now, the first one, what we are seeing is the dance version of the dhamal. Now, the, an interesting aspect of the dance dhamal is that here, I mean, obviously right now it has just started. It is in a very soft version. But as it goes on, the music grows very frenzy. And then the voices get subdued. And it is mostly the sound of the musical instruments that is being played. And then the people dance in a very fast manner with those frenzied musical performance. Another aspect of this dhamal is there is also a very interesting gender dynamics to it. Now here what we can see it is all the males who are sitting here and performing. Now there are females as well who are not actively taking part there. They are in the audience space. Now, when dhamals are specifically performed, and it is not always applicable, but on a majority of the occasions what is seen, when dhamals are performed for the male spiritual leaders, mostly it is the male who take an active part, and female usually remain in the audience. They Obviously, they can sing amongst themselves, but they can't take an active part along with the men. On the other uh, version of it, if there are dhamals of my misra, let's say as an example, when we have the dhamals for the women spiritual leaders, it is mostly the women who take the central role and men remains in the audience. So this is an interesting aspect of this particular performance. And I would also like to draw a bit of attention on the lyrics of this particular dhamal. So and the necessity of doing this is because you know what happens? Uh, they tell the stories of how their ancestors have taken such hardships and have traveled across the oceans, the forests, the deserts, and the mountains to come to Gujarat and bless them. And this Tamal is particularly written as a dedication to one of their one of the many Siddhi spiritual leaders who is known by the name Siddhi Bilal or Bilal Siddhi. And it says that there are many Bilals, there are many Bilals who are spiritually respected across this whole world, but Siddhi Bilal is only one. And we are blessed by Siddhi Bilal and who has arrived from the precious and the pious region of Medina and has come from Ethiopia through that place to Gujarat and bless us. So that is why, just to read out the lyrics very briefly, that Ya Bilal saw Bilal. Ya le so Bilal, Madina wale Bilal. So there are hundreds of Bilal, but we are singing this particular zikr is dedicated only to that particular Madina wale Bilal who has come to bless us. Yes, you can go ahead.
Yes, uh, so in this particular particular dhamal, this is the sitting version of the dhamal where uh, they are again uh, singing about how their, uh, you know, spiritual ancestors have come from far off lands and they have come, they have taken so much of hardship to come and bless them. It says that Dada Mere Var Se Aaye, that is from far of lands and the oceans. And they have taken so much of hardships, they have done so much of sacrifices just to come to Gujarat and spiritually enlighten this community. And not only just the cities, but every other community that exists around there. This particular song is again very interesting and how the creolized pattern of expression gets again very highlighted here is it just doesn't speak to the Siddhi spiritual values. It also speaks to that how the spiritual leaders have blessed every community in Gujarat, whosoever have sought blessings from them. So uh, this is an example of Baitaki one, uh, version of the Zikr, where they are sitting and performing. And the musical instruments that you are seeing is referred to as Musindo, the one that I just mentioned at the beginning of my lecture. And what I've also done is I know there are some sort of probably uh, internet issues, uh, the, the, you know, the documentary is getting stopped in the middle. So I have shared the link as well in the chat. You can look at the documentary at your own free time, whenever you wish. It's accessible through my archive, through my personal archive, Roots and Roots. And uh, there are other documentaries of uh, and videos of this sort of dhamals dancing dhamal, baitaki dhamal, where only women are performing. So you can take a look at your own time through those as well, just to see how different ways these dhamals and zikars are performed by the siddhis. I will be now moving gradually towards the conclusion of my presentation. And then obviously we can uh, break for questions and reflections. Uh, just one thing to say that uh, today the siddhi community, the very unfortunate thing is, uh, that the Siddhi community, despite the fact that they have stayed and resided in India for centuries, uh, they have Indian citizenship, they also have all the documents required to prove themselves officially as Indian citizens, still they encounter a lot of this racial marginalization across country. Even in Gujarat as well, you know, for example, when they go to the banks to open up bank accounts, 
you know, they they are subject to, to different forms of you know marginalizations and harassments. That despite the fact that they produce all the required documents that are produced by any other Indian citizen, just because they have a different anatomical structure, just because they have a different hair pattern, just because they have a different skin color, they are subjected to these sorts of harassments on a daily basis. And for them to overcome the frustrations of these harassments, these musical practices, these cultures serve as a form of empowerment to them. It is an empowerment. It is a way of generating resistance through affect, through invitational manner, not through violence. That you see, you are very invited to our space. Through these spaces, they try to tell the communities who lie outside the cities that you are very invited to our space and learn about our cultures and traditions. And it is a form of resistance as well. It is a form of empowerment as well because these performances and also there are dances and all. In one of the videos in my YouTube channel, if you see, uh, which I just uploaded a couple of weeks back, where they uh, were celebrating the Urs, you know, in the Ratanpur area of Gujarat, which is another place for the cities, you will see how they are dancing, you know, inside a mosque, inside a darga. They are dancing in circle, the Siddhi community of Ratanpur. And so you see, this is how through dancing, through singing, through music, through all these performances, they basically try to preserve their African ancestral cultures on the one side, and at the same time to acknowledge the spiritual values, the cultural values of the locality where they exist on the other. So this creolized elements that we see here is not just a sort of performance. It is also a form of resistance. It is also a form of acknowledgement. And also it diversely serves as a place for breathing, caring and sharing for these communities. Now I would like to request Barsha just to show a small clip of 30 seconds, you know, of how women are pe performing the zikr of this women spiritual leader. And with that, I will end my presentation. Please go ahead, Barsha. Yes, sir. Just give me one minute. Sure. Is it visible, sir? Is it visible, sir? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, just to uh, conclude the presentation, I would say that this is uh, Hamida Makwa Siddhi and the lady who is leading the song. And she is um, one of the eldest surviving Siddhi member now in Gujarat. Obviously, that age group of 80 plus and more are gradually fading very unfortunately. So at the personal level, I felt that along with the Siddhi community members, it is necessary to document these presentations and it is important to archive them. And uh, one interesting name is uh, when you will look through the videos, if and when you look through the videos, you will see that I have given courtesies to different Siddhi community members. And they have very interesting names. They have 
like you will see these names like middle names like Makwa, Murima. Now, these names are not just uh, names just coming from nowhere. If you go to Tanzania, if you go to Kenya, there are names of villages which have these names as Makwa and Murima. Now, Makwa and Murima are the names of these villages. So, for example, so today, if you go to, let's say, in Tanzania, you will find a village in the name of Murima, which consists of Murima community members. And those cities who has this middle name as Murima, they trace their ancestry from that particular village. So this is also very interesting how they maintain that relationality with their ancestral roots through music, through their names, through their cultures and traditions. So I'll stop here maybe and feel free to ask me any question and share your reflections. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will just quickly play the last credits of your uh, documentary so that everybody can see the names that you were just mentioning. Sure, please do that. This is so fascinating, Dr. Day. I just want you to go on and on. <laughs> I mean, this is, this thank you so, so much. So thank you so much, Professor. So interesting. I don't know if you have heard about uh, the Ziki Songs of Assam. Have you heard about the Ziki Songs of Assam? Yeah. I mean, it comes yes. from a different root, of course, hmm. an entirely different uh, context. But um, we have probably Iqbal here with us, a young scholar who is working on Sufi music in Assam. And uh, he might uh, have something interesting to share with us. But this is really so fascinating. And this is a living tradition still, right, Dr. Day? I mean, this is still Absolutely. very much. Absolutely. And uh, they're actually working very hard and very structurally. Like, for instance, I would just like to add what you were saying, that uh, if you ever go to Gujarat, they have these communities called the uh, Jamaat Siddhi, Jamaat Society, uh, then Al Goma Mubrik, uh, you know, institution, trust. So what they're doing is some of the Siddhis, you know, who have, uh, who were lucky and perseverant enough to emerge professionally as lawyers, doctors, social scientists, they are now trying to, uh, you know, establish these spaces to preserve their community cultures and traditions. And uh, through establishing schools locally, uh, at the same time, they will actually coordinate with organizations like ICSSR, ICHR, and they will organize dance festivals and musical okay. festivals in okay. very prominent spaces across India, uh, and across the world, like uh, one of the one of the person who is also a nice friend of mine is uh, Farooq Murima Siddi. Now, Farooq Murima Siddi actually has been for the last 10 years has been performing with his troupe across the world. Recently, he went to Mexico. He went to Canada. He also was a part of the major folk music festivals and Sufi music festivals across India and other parts of the world. And they're all being sponsored, you know, by different private organizations and then government spaces like ICHR, ICSSR and all. So uh, so they are trying from their, you know, they're trying their best from their side to structurally preserve uh, these narratives and these living traditions of their community. Well, that story that you narrated was so interesting about, uh, you know, that uh, the, the mother goddess and how, you know, the story of the uh the goddess was reconciled with the you know with islam and with sufism yes. you know the wonderful syncretic traditions that we have you know all over our country and every time you hear these stories they make you feel so proud yes sure our young scholars will have uh, lots of you know interesting things to share maybe my colleagues can also i'm sure dr parasman Dutta would also like to say something about this it must be as yeah, fascinating. No, no yeah yeah am i audible now yes 
Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Day. Yeah, it was really fascinating, you know, listening to you. And uh, yeah, I don't know what to say, but uh, yeah, I have a whole lot of curiosities, you know, about these uh, things. But that perhaps happens, you know, when you are exposed to a new kind of stuff. But I liked your presentations and really I like this uh, musical form. You know, I'm not a musicologist, but the tone of the drum and all this sounds phonetic part that really speaks of the passion of the community. And it is wonderful to know that, you know, um, how a marginalized community in current times actually they are using their music as an instrument of resistance and perhaps consolidating their own internal identity, you know, collectivity, something like that. It is really fascinating. And yeah, definitely I will look forward to this for more. I will definitely explore the link you have shared and I will explore your archives. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank By the way, I've already subscribed to your channel. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, and also because Professor Nath, you were sharing that uh, how that story about Makhan Devi and my Mishra was so interesting to you. Let me share with you another very small anecdote, uh, another as a, as a part of their folklore. Uh, if you if you go to Ahmedabad, if you go to Ahmedabad, and there is a place called the Siddi Syed Mosque. Now, if you walk around the Siddi Syed Mosque around the market, you will see it is all the Siddi community members who are having shops there, street shops, food shops, you know, garment shops, and so it's all the Siddi community. Interestingly, they worship Goddess Lakshmi on an everyday basis. Now, why do they worship or how did that happen? There is another folklore to that. And it connects to the time when Ahmeda, Ahmed Shah Badshah was the, at that time the leader of Gujarat. Now, Ahmed Shah Badshah's, uh, the whole architecture was very interesting. Now, he had, you know, to protect his kingdom, he had several gates around his kingdom. And there is this one famous place called the Teen Darwaza. That is where the Siddhi Said Mosque is basically located. Now, if you go there, there is a story which is a which is a sort of oral folklore, not yet has been written uh, like written or documented theoretically so far. And it says that uh, once Amit, like Siddhi Said was the guard, was the palace guard of Amit Shabatsha's palace. And one day he was guarding the palace and he saw that all of a sudden goddess Lakshmi is running out of the palace. So, uh, Amit, so, so Siddhi Said was very taken aback and then he stopped Goddess Lakshmi and uh, politely requested her that why are you running away? Ma, why, what is wrong? She said that you see I am totally irritated and agitated with your uh, financial situation of this whole kingdom. Some people are so rich, some people are so poor. It shows that how corrupted is your kingdom. And for me, as Goddess Lakshmi, it is not possible for me to stay here anymore. It's impossible. Siddhi Said tried to, you know, beg her pardon, tried to say sorry to her, tried to pursue her that so that so that she please stay in the kingdom. But she was adamant. She said, no, I'm not going to stay in this kingdom. I'm going to leave this kingdom and walk out of this place. Then for the last time, Siddhi Said requested her that, okay, fine, if you are so adamant, you may leave, but please allow me to at least inform this to Amit Shah Badshah, the king, so that he is aware of it. Then he goes to Amit Shah Badshah and narrates the story, and Amit Shah Badshah is absolutely tensed. That if Lakshmi leaves the kingdom, it means all the property, all the financial stature of the kingdom is gone with her. How will that be possible? Amit Shah Badshah says that uh, I my mind is not working. Siddhi Said, you have to do something. Siddhi Said said that, you see, there is one way of doing. When I requested Goddess Lakshmi, Goddess Lakshmi gave me a proposal that, yes, under one condition, she will wait for me to go back to her. That if you doesn't agree, if you don't transform, to agree to transform your kingdom, then she will also take me along with her and I have to go along with her. So there is an alternate to that. You kill me. Siddhi Said says to Amit Shah Badshah that you kill me. So me and my dead body and my soul will live in this kingdom. And if my remainings live in this kingdom, Goddess Lakshmi will also be in this kingdom because she promised me she will not live without me. Amit Shah Badshah says it's impossible. How can I kill somebody and commit this sin? Because if I kill you, it will be a sinful act because you have not done anything wrong and I am basically murdering you. 
He says, sorry, I can't do that. Then Sidi Sayed slashes his neck, kills himself. And that is how Goddess Lakshmi stays back. But Goddess Lakshmi gives one blessing and one curse. The blessing is that the Siddhi people will never run out of money. No matter how poor they are, whatever is the scenario in their life, they will never run out of money. But the curse is Siddhis also will never be rich people. So today, Siddhi people usually sometimes seriously, sometimes as a joke, they will often share with you while you talk to them that you see we are so blessed that even in the most critical of the scenarios, we are never out of food, we are never out of money. But also you don't see the Siddhis as really rich and flourishing people here. So I wanted to share this as well because this also widely speaks to the trans-religious existence in Gujarat. Thank you so much, sir. It was uh, truly very fascinating. And as more and more we get to know your uh, little snippets and anecdotes that you are giving, it's uh, it's becoming more and more interesting to deal, to get indulged in the discussion. So I would now open the platform for all the participants over here to take part in this discussion. You can write your questions, your comments, your suggestions in the chat box, or you can raise hand so that we can allow you uh, to, uh, to use your audio and speak. Uh, so we are uh, right now inviting all the questions and the stage is open. Yeah, Dr. Day, if I may just uh, add to already what has been said, mm, but just a small inquiry. It, could you trace the origin of this word dhamal? I'm really curious because there's a lot of uh, song and dance form which relate to this word dhamal. Even in Bengal, there is a dhamal, I believe. In the eastern part of Bengal, there is dhamal. In Haryana, there is dhamal. So, so could you trace this origin of this word? Oh, thank you so much for this uh, very, very crucial question, Dr. Das. Actually, I have, uh, I mean, I tried to go through the existing uh, scholarships that uh, that are available on the basis of the Siddhis, cultures and traditions. Um, and uh, obviously not much has been written specifically on this musical pattern. I mean, a lot has been written on their histories and cultures and traditions, but not specifically on this musical pattern. So the next a way of finding out was to engage with the city community and ask them. So I has talked to several community elders who were available, who were then available in Gujarat. And uh, uh, usually there is no concrete understanding that how this word dhamal, they have, uh, they have imbibed within their cultural space. Usually how they relate to this concept of dhamal to their performances the, the word dhamal, which can be traced to Urdu as well as a general tracing, the word dhamal basically uh, means something which is done in a very musical and frenzied way. Okay, when you play something very fast and that is a sort of dhamal. And, that, and they usually associate the concept of dhamal with the way, the fashion in which they play their zikr music. Because it starts in a slow pattern. And then it moves in a fast and frenzied way. And then again, it slows down. So usually uh, when I ask them that how do you trace this particular word, they were unable to say anything. But they were able to tell me that how do they associate the concept of dhamal with the pattern of their music. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We also have uh, Rishabh Chand over here. Raising his hand. Uh, Rishabh, you can just uh, ask your question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Good afternoon, Dr. Day, and thank you for this amazing presentation. Uh, before I go further, I would like to mention that I am what you would call a layman when it comes to this area of research. Because I'm actually pursuing my PhD in chemical engineering in the Technical University of Denmark. So nevertheless, I have a couple of questions because I guess curiosity has no boundaries. So I have two questions. One is regarding the language of the Zikas and one is regarding the uh, what is the musicality. So about the language, what I observed or what I heard, it's mostly Hindi and Urdu. So 
my first question is uh, why do you think uh, the native language of gujarat or gujarati hasn't crept into the zikrs and why it has continued being sung in only hindi and urdu and the next question is about musicality as you said this is a, a variation of sufi music or qawwali music and if i'm not wrong uh, uh, when islam and hinduism came in contact in the, in the last millennium that's how hindustani classical music was born in the gangetic uh, plains and that's when it diverged from carnatic musical so uh, why and because uh, gujarat is geographically kind of far away from both the center of carnatic music and also hindustani music why do you think it is still influenced mostly by hindustani classical which is also related to sufi and qawwali and is there any evidence in literature which suggests that there is an influence of carnatic music as well these are the questions yeah thank you so much uh, thank you so much for this really interesting questions rishav uh, to answer your first question um, actually uh, the zikrs that they when they started if you look at the history of the zikrs of uh, the siddhi community in gujarat uh, if you look at the elders you know like hamida makwa siddhi i shared one of them and the other elders when they started singing their zikrs mostly they were in the swahili language now what happened uh, it was not purely swahili as well because when they came here the swahili got intermixed with urdu and hindi and other languages now why the influence of the urdu language is there very prominently the influence of the urdu language is because they mostly arrived here with the islamic invaders so urdu persian you don't find much of that but urdu is there this is because of this one particular influence now the interesting aspect is why they haven't imbibed gujarati words or uh, but mostly i mean if you say hud i mean urdu and hindi have a lot of similarities as well like lot of urdu words have traveled into hindi words as well yes. so that is what another reason makes it uh, close to the hindi language as well and gujarati why it has not traveled into that space because they continue to they make sure that they continue to sing those particular zikrs that they have imbibed from their forefathers so what happens a lot of those swahili words have got merged with hindi and urdu words but they have not been able to imbibe or many of them have been resistant to the gujarati words as well or the gujarati language as well because somewhere somewhat they thought that it is going to disturb the cultural social and the historical narrative that exist with respect to their zikrs so it is also a sort of resistance and you also find a lot of ignorance as well it is a mix of resistance and ignorance that why they have not like imbibe this uh, you know gujarati words into their particular zikrs in fact i have documented a few uh, like uh, because of the current monograph that i am preparing out of this research i have documented a few zikrs as well which i am going to put in the monograph uh, as well which actually consists of you know uh, swahili creole words so just to let you know what are swahili creole words they are not the usual swahili that is being spoken in places like kenya and tanzania or other parts of uh, africa but they have got intermixed with the you know local uh, you know urdu words uh, mostly urdu words and a few tamil words so i will just read one particular very small zikr in the swahili creole which will give you a wider idea that how not the process of not imbibing uh, gujarati words is also a form of resistance for them so there is a, a swahili creole which has which says ya bolo sabaya hua ve ya bolo sabaya hua ve hu sabaya salwale nabi sultan so basically they are singing this particular zikr and is dedicated to one of their siddhi leaders by the name of nabi sultan and here you will see the uh, the creole words the swahili creole now when you see the word who who is a sufi expression allah who is a very common sufi expression in singing allah who is a very common qawwali expression in singing who is also a common swahili expression to give consent who is also means to give consent sabaya in the swahili creole version in swahili also the word sabaya is used it means it is okay everything is all right so it means that siddhi sultan their spiritual leader has arrived now everything is okay no problem so these are the two words 
which has a close association with the Swahili language as well. Now, coming to the uh, next question, the influence of uh, more of uh, the Hindu classical music, because now that has to do with uh, what was the musical culture at that point of time when the Ahmed Shah uh, that dynasty was existing. Okay, the, at the time of the Ahmed Shah Badshah. So mostly you see it is the, obviously if you look at the history of Ahmed Shah Badshah and his taste for music, you will see a lot of influence of the musical cultures that were imbibed from Central Asia, from the parts of Turkey and from Central Asian regions, and uh, also the Hindustan classical, uh, Hindustani classical music that was also very much encouraged. So in his, if you look, uh, look at the musical history at the time of his regime, you will see that uh, he encouraged a lot of this blend of the Central Asian music with the Hindustani classical music. So if you look at the musical uh, performances of the Siddhis, you see an influence of the blend of these two music apart from the Sufi cultural traditions. And why not Carnatic music? Now, you will see this sort of influence if you look at the musical cultures of the Siddhi community in Karnataka. If you look at the musical cultures of the Siddhi community in Karnataka, you will see they have drawn a lot so the way they play the musical instruments, obviously in the Siddhi community in, uh, uh, the community in Karnataka, they are not so uh, alert and aware of their ancestral language. That's why the songs that they mostly seen are centrally in the Kannada language and also the way they play the music out on the drums and other sort of things, other sort of musical instruments. It is an influence of the Carnatic music there. So uh, these are some of the sort of differences that we see. Okay. Thank you so much for the answer. I actually forgot to mention about the Swahili language as well, but thank you for including okay. that in your explanation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. We have a couple of more questions in the chat box. One is from uh, Rahu Misi. He asked the question, to what extent are archives so helpful to evaluate cultural interactions and hmm. how rewriting history is important for the history of art rituals. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much Rao, for this uh, interesting question. See, I mean, cultural archives play a very important role in rewriting histories, revisiting histories. I mean, I'm a bit skeptical about the term rewriting because especially when I take into account the whole colonial project of rewriting our histories, how they have rewritten our past and presented them in very problematic assimilative ways. But I would say use the term maybe revisiting and rethinking our existing historical spaces, which the, uh, which doesn't sound as invasive as I say when I say rewriting. So in that case, see, uh, when we talk about the cultural archives, obviously they play a very crucial role because um, the Siddhi community, if I again speak in basically in sync with the Siddhi community, they are trying very best to sensitize the present generation of children, you know, about their cultures and traditions. I mean, if you look at the last zikr, the last thamal being performed in the documentary, you will see a lot of children are participating along with the elderly women and men. So it is a way of sensitizing them. Maybe they are all not singing. They are just sitting and listening. But that is how, you know, our conscience is shaped. Like when they grow up, probably and hopefully, they will continue with these rituals and traditions when the community elders won't be there. So they are trying their best. But also, you know, this whole capitalistic knowledge cultures have always been playing a spoil sport in this whole process. And uh, so who never... I mean, who knows if let's not expect that, but it, unfortunately, some of their traditions, some of their cultures, some of their histories fade away. At least these archives, like what I have generated and what other several Siddhi community members are also doing from their own ends. A lot of them have their YouTube channels like Siddhi culture. There is a YouTube channel. Then individual Siddhis have opened their YouTube channel. And they're documenting every dance, music, stories, histories, rituals there. Who knows if these fades away one day, then probably these are the archives that will only live to look up to and to preserve these cultures and traditions. But 
at the same time of archiving, which actually I think also connects to your second question, it is important for us, especially people like me who are not Siddhis, who do not belong to indigenous community spaces, to be very aware and respectful to these rituals and traditions. Because often what happens, especially in anthropological research and also research in cultural studies, there is always a lot of tendency. Uh, I mean, they may be conscious, they may be unconscious as well, but a lot of these tendencies to appropriate these knowledge systems and interpret them in our own ways, which is very problematic. When we are archiving, I also want to make sure that when we are thinking of revisiting or uh, rethinking about our existing histories and cultures about arts, rituals, lifestyles, fashion, food, and various other aspects. It is important that obviously these archives are going to help us, but when, if we are personally taking initiative of archiving rituals, it is very important to uh, treat the community members as a part of our research, not just objects of data mining. So this is very important. I think I thought it is also important for us to mention as well that archiving is good, but we need to take into account these problematic and the, these problems and challenges as well while we are, uh, you know, engaging ourselves in the process of archiving. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm just going to read out the next question in the chat box. It's from uh, Anish Amrit. Uh, she asks, which sect of Muslim this Siddhi community belongs to? Yes, Anish, this is uh, another interesting aspect of the Siddhi community. They very deliberately don't identify them with a particular sect. And that is a deliberate attempt because if and when they do that, they become circumscribed within the mainstream rituals. And that just doesn't erase their names or identities, but also it erases their cultural histories and geographical origins and their ancestral roots as well. So it is another very important aspect of the Siddhi community that they will never say that we are part of the Shia or Sunni or any other Islamic sect. They will always call, they will always acknowledge and that is why they are so very, uh, you know, focused about these Creole cultures, traditions, their musical practices and publicly presenting them, narrating these folklores through their songs. That is why they are so crucial and careful about these aspects. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would ask if there are any other questions. Yes, sir. Parishmani, sir. Uh, Dr. Ode, I am curious if you can uh, uh, speak on something like the current status of this uh, musical form you know i am asking in the present day context when we see that most of the traditional forms they are actually no longer in that conformity you know for the good reasons or the bad reasons sometimes these are happening in nice ways but sometimes these are happening in bad ways that actually they are uh, territorial boundaries are re-territorialized so uh, what is the situation in the context of this performance uh, tradition uh i'll be curious have you seen any instance of any non siddhi individual or performers actually singing dhamal or jikar oh that's a fantastic question actually unfortunately not i mean non siddhi uh, non siddhi people do come in large numbers to attend uh, these zikrs and dhamals and especially those who are muslims they will obviously when the others are singing they will sit and participate but uh, if you look from a perspective that where non-Siddhi singers or non-Siddhi individuals are taking initiative from their site uh, to sing these zikrs and dhamals, unfortunately, it is not. Now, uh, two reasons that work in this case. Let's say uh, for us researchers and scholars who are a bit aware and sensitive about the methodologies, we are always afraid of the fact that if we fail to sing and appreciate the ways, the cultural ways in which they are sung, then we might end up doing something else, which is like a sort of a distortion and misappropriating their cultures, which is very problematic. Like, for instance, I remember everyone, especially the community elders, they shared with me a whole archive of 100 Zikr songs. It is still there in my laptop. I have archived them. And they shared that 
you see it is not just our responsibility to sing and archive them it is your responsibility also you should also go back and sing and archive them and i personal level i wanted to do that but i am always driven by this fear that see i mean walking into a community and just working them with them for a few years will never make me an expert i will always remain a non siddhi i will always remain an outsider and i acknowledge that space i don't want to be an invader into their space uh but that fear also works that obviously if i am unable to imitate the the tune the the words the pronunciations the emotion in that song then it will be just remain in an archive but it will be a sort of misappropriated archive so this fear works amongst us researchers but and there are other people who may not feel just they are not just aware i mean okay somebody else is singing why should i sing just the casual attitude or the sort of ignorance that plays in these spaces so this is obviously a sort of challenge uh, which they are also trying to overcome by having more and more non siddhi people at least when they are singing in big groups they there you will see a lot of participation from the non siddhi people and then they obviously be a part of the zikr singing so certain slight changes are taking place but i think it is going to take a long period of time uh, before you know non siddhi communities really are able to confidently uh, take an active role in the zikr and singing and dhamal dancing thank you thank you you have uh, described the situation perfectly and yeah and performance is one thing but this performance should be heard by everyone probably all across yes. you know all over the world this is a, such a yes. fantastic performance form and also it such a wonderful history of yes. cultural migration and something like that thank you thank you thank you sir uh, do we have any other question so uh, sir can we wind up then uh, since we don't have any other questions so is it okay if we wind up sure okay so before uh, winding up i would like to request uh, research scholar of the department of cultural studies uh, prachi chauhan to deliver the vote of thanks for today's lecture prachi thank you varsha so on behalf of the department of cultural studies i would like to extend gratitude to the speaker of today's lecture dr sayan de for such an insightful lecture and uh, his valuable time i would like to thank uh, head of the department of cultural studies professor devarshi prasad nath to uh, give us this opportunity of organizing this lecture series monthly lecture series of which this was the first lecture i would also like to extend gratitude towards uh, barsha nayak and madhurja gogoi research scholars department of cultural studies for organizing this lecture lastly i would like to thank all the participants who participated so patiently and uh, became such a wide uh, became such a patient audience thank you everyone we hope uh, we will be looking forward to your presence for the upcoming lectures thank you everyone once again one one uh, kind of vote of thanks from my side as well especially for varsha varsha thank you for connecting us with dr day and we will keep this association going and uh, also thank to madhu and all those who have been you know involved in organizing this lecture and i can also see one layer here one layer hello and uh, congratulations on your new assignment i believe you have taken up the teaching job in the university so hello to one layer as well okay thank you thank you so, so much everyone thank you dr day thank you so much all of you for your wonderful uh, interactions you, and questions uh, thank you yes yes please go ahead no no problem please go ahead varsha yes yes sir thank you so much sir for so graciously accepting uh, our amateur <laughs> if i can say like that amateur invitations to you and so graciously giving us uh, so much of time Uh, over the last whole week uh, and whenever i had any kind of doubt uh, you actually uh, solved uh, all of them with giving a lot of time and we we in fact sat down 
and decided which parts to keep from the documentary that you gave. And that kind of time I, I really appreciate and thank you so much for giving us uh, this kind of time. And I hope we would, uh, you know, keep this as uh, Professor Nath has already said, keep this uh, association going and we would hear more and more from your work and maybe some other lectures in the coming days. And uh, thank you so much. I would also like to thank all the faculty members from the Department of Cultural Studies who are present here. And uh, yeah, thank you so much and have a nice day, all of you. Thank you so much and uh, please take care and let's keep this conversation going. And since already yes. Professor Nath shared that about the ritual of Jikar in Assam as well, it just opens up so many possibilities yes. of seeing the overlaps and collaboration. So please take care and stay well and let's keep in touch. Please take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.